Good afternoon to everybody here. Now, the first order of business is if you would be so gracious, anybody who wants to move forward, that is always a, um, a lovely thing to do for the speaker. Okay, um, welcome to the PMA. Obviously, please turn all of your cell phones off so they don't go off during the talk. And one more thing to know is that although this building is closing uh, after the lecture is over, the main museum is going to be open until 8.45 this evening, and that means that the Temple Hall itself that you're going to be hearing about is going to be there, so you can actually walk across the street and get an experience of it with your um, newly discovered knowledge. So I want to begin by thanking Miss Adeline Pepper Gibson, who passed away 100 years ago in 1919, and also her family. It was Adeline who, while on her honeymoon trip to South India, to the South Indian city of Madurai in 1912, purchased 64 huge carved blocks of granite from a small Hindu temple and amazingly managed to ship them to the US. But World War I intervened and after Adeline's untimely death at the age of 35 while a war nurse in France, her family generously donated the pieces to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. This year marks the 100th anniversary of that gift. First set up in Memorial Hall, the museum's first home and now the Please Touch Museum in Fairmont Park, the installation was reconfigured and opened in its current location on the second floor of the main building in 1940. Dark and spooky for much of the intervening time. In late 2016, it reopened, now filled with light, a video presentation from the temple where the pieces were found, and a new timeline of its history. Today's lecture is one of various programs and a forthcoming publication through which we celebrate the centenary of this acquisition, unique outside of India, together with its grand opening in 1920. I want to greet and thank as well two members of Adeline's uh, family tree, Eleanor Coates and Susan Treadway, who are here in the audience with us today. Much thanks goes to Timothy Rubb, the director and CEO of this museum, for his enthusiasm that made this program possible. Linnea West and our public programs team for her and her, her team's superb organization. Leslie Esseglu, department manager for South Asian art for her untold uh, reams of hard work, our great AV team, and the many others who came together to bring this to you today. My greatest thanks, of course, goes to our speaker, the inimitable Professor Crispin Brandfoot, who flew from London to share his deep knowledge of the architecture and sculpture of Southern India, particularly a lifetime studying the temples most related to the museum's hall. Professor Brandfoot is a reader in the history of South Asian art and archeology, span known as SOAS, at the School of African and Oriental Studies, South Asian Institute, University of London, England. Um, I have his biography, I don't wanna spend too much time, um, but he um, was at various points in his past um, at De Montfort University in Leicester, England, and worked as a museum assistant in both the departments of Eastern Art at the Ashmolean Museum, Oxford, and the Department of Oriental Antiquities at the British Museum, London, so museums are not unknown to him. His primary research examines the arts of Southern India from the 14th to 20th centuries, especially that of the Madurai Nayak dynasty, which um, very much relates to our hall. And he's also gone deeply into issues resulting from the establishment of British colonial authority in the region. While they have uh, remained and are today vibrant living shrines for devotees and pilgrims from around the world, for most of the 20th century, the often enormous and complex temples built between the 16th and 18th century in the Madurai region had been virtually ignored by scholars both inside and outside of India who considered them too late to be of artistic value. Professor Brandfoot has made it his personal mission to reverse that scholarly trend, an extraordinary day-long discussion with 25 scholars of many disciplines held yesterday across the street vividly demonstrated this and how great the interest is um, in these buildings now. 
I will not go into as many publications. They are now not just ranging from the art and architecture of this period, but into um, devotion and into photography and into a range of other subjects. So don't let his British diffidence fool you. He's going to kill me for that one. Um, but Professor Brownsfoot is a groundbreaking scholar, and we're thrilled to have him here to give us a new and expanded picture through which we can all better understand the beloved Indian pillared hall that for a century has communicated unique forms, ideas, and energy literally halfway around the world. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for coming. Thank you, Dale, and the whole team of the Philadelphia Museum of Art for organizing this. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. So um, the magnificent Temple Hall, uh, now here in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, is, as uh, you all know, was acquired in 1912 from the city of Madurai in South India and donated to the museum seven years later in 1919. Uh, in my talk this afternoon, I'd like to return to Madurai and explore the temples of South India so that we may perhaps better understand the, the architectural tradition within which this hall was built, the design and purpose of such buildings, and the forms and subjects of the sculpture now on display. And then I'll uh, conclude by briefly considering the place of this building and its sculpture within the reception, collection, and evaluation of Indian art in the West. Now, temples have been built in stone in the Tamil region of South India since around the 6th and 7th centuries, both rock-cut monuments excavated from the living rock uh, and structural ones, such as these. The earliest monuments uh, are to be found both to the north and south of the River Carvery that runs through the centre of the region. And these include the well-known, te well-visited temples at the Pallava capital at Marmalapuram on the coast uh, south of, of Chennai, or uh, former Madras, uh, and also inland at Kanchipuram, their former capital, and the monuments in the southern Pandya region around Madurai and Purakatai, of which uh, these buildings are near. As structural temples began to be built in greater numbers from 700, it became common for the main shrine to be surrounded by uh, an enclosure wall that was punctuated by one or more gateways that were usually aligned with the primary axis of access towards the ritual center. The subsequent millennium-long history of the temple up until the 16th and 17th century sees the temple's expansion uh, with longer approaches to the main shrine, often hidden within multiple concentric walled enclosures, as you see here, uh, with the walls punctuated by these characteristic South Indian monumental pyramidal gateways or gopurams. The multiplication of concentric enclosures begins in the 11th century, uh, but is primarily a development of the 13th century and later for the largest and most important temples. By the 17th century, many temples in the Tamil region are of a vast scale, dominating the urban fabric, and this is why they're often known as, as temple cities, for the scale of them, such as you see here. The very largest temples have two, three, or even four high-walled enclosures, or seven in the exceptional case of the Ranganatha Temple at Sriangam, as seen here, all entered through an aligned series of gopurams, these large pyramidal gateways. Temple space is thus organized as a concentric hierarchy around the most powerful sacred center, the location of the preeminent deity of the temple and the hierarchy of sacred space emanating out from the center that the walls and the gateways define had in the past at least a social dimension and in the gradation of access that both individuals and groups had to seeing and being seen by the deity, the very important ritual of darshan, the exchange of sight with, with the living presence of the deity. And this pattern of temple development is evident in the many temples built at the heart of the city of Madurai, to which I now turn. As both a sacred and political center, Madurai in the very far south here 
Madurai's history can be traced back 2,000 years to the early centuries CE. As a political center, it was the capital of the Pandya Empire in the deep south from the 6th century, a rival to the Pallavas and later the Cholas further north in this southern Tamil region. Despite this importance, there's little in this now within the city of Madurai itself directly attributable to the long period of Pandyan rule up to the early 14th century. And so the material fabric of the city seen today owes a great deal to the presence of the Nayakas, who ruled over the city for two centuries until 1736, a period when Madurai again became a major political center of power, of political power and cultural dynamism. The Nayakas were the regional governors of the Vijayanagara Empire that had been founded in the 14th century with its eponymous capital in the northern Deccan, marked here in today's Karnataka. And this empire at its height in the early 16th century dominated the whole of southern India. From their origins in the 1520s, three dynastic lineages of Nayakas were established in the Tamil country that grew to rival and ultimately to outlive the authority, if not the imperial memory of the Vijayanagara Empire. And one of these lineages of Nayakas, these former line, uh, regional governors, was based in this city of Madurai. Now, as outsiders to Pandyanar in the far south, the authority of the Madurai Nayakas was initially based upon their relationship with their Vijayanagara overlords to the farther north. But over the course of the later 16th and 17th centuries, especially following the catastrophic uh, defeat of the Vijayanagara Empire and the sack of the capital city in 1565, the Madurai Nayakas consolidated their rule by shifting their attention to their relationship with the communities of the far south. And they did this in part through the expansion, the renovation, and the construction of temples. And it's within this framework of political change that I think we can understand the, the transformation of the city of Madurai in the 16th and 17th centuries. And it's also within this framework that the tradition and innovation evident in the arts of the period may be understood. The huge temple at the center of the city that some of you may have visited is dedicated to a local goddess whose name Meenakshi, the fish-eyed one, and she's there at the center of the city ruling alongside her consort Sundareshvara, the beautiful lord, Shiva as the beautiful lord. And this temple, as you see a view over here, and the plan with the dominance of the city at, at its center is rightly emphasized as one of the major monuments of the Nayaka period in the later 16th and 17th centuries. But it's only one of many temples built in the 16th and 17th centuries in Madurai, as well as a monumental palace down here in the, the lower corner of the, the plan. The city plan you see there today largely dates to the 16th century, but it may largely replicate a much earlier city plan. But as I say, we don't have very much evidence to interpret what that earlier city might have looked like. And indeed, the early modern Nayaka city plan was itself modified during the colonial period, uh, particularly from the 1840s when the old fort walls and the moat that surrounded the old center of the city, uh, the walls were pulled down, the moat was filled in, opening up the city to lead to expansion that you see today. The Meenakshi Sundareshvara temple to these two days uh, to these two deities is composed of two separate shrines marked here in blue and red. Sundareshvara to the northeast and Meenakshi on his right to the southwest. Streets surround the temple and lead towards entrances on all four sides, these black markers leading around the, uh, the side of this temple. Though founded in the 11th century or earlier, the temple visited today mostly dates to the 16th century, coinciding with a peak of, of activity in terms of building activity in the late 16th and early 17th century, which coincides with the Madurai Nayaka's greatest power over the southern Tamil region of India. The reconstruction of the temple is often attributed to uh, one particular Nayaka, uh, Tiramala Nayaka, who reigned from 1623 to 1659 and was a contemporary of the great Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan in North India, famous for the patronage of the Taj Mahal. 
But in fact, the temple was built over a much longer period, by, particularly by his predecessors, especially Vishwanatha, Krishnapa, and Virapa from 1530 to 1595. So we have this longer period of construction. The gopuras, these tall pyramidal gateways seen today, was largely constructed in the second half of the 16th century, together with a monumental, uh, what's called a thousand-columned hall. This great uh, hall in the corner here was also built in the late 16th century. During Tiramala's reign in the early 17th century, another period of expansion of the temple was planned with the construction of the new hall, or Pudu Mandapam, this long hall here, and also the foundations here of a monumental new gateway, which, if it had ever been completed, would have been... Uh, sorry, I'm showing my cursor, but it clearly... Shall I try this? Uh, no. Yes. Okay. If I can hold my old hand still. Uh, the expansion in the early 17th century of this monumental columned hall here and the foundations of here of one of these monumental gateways. Uh, these gateways here, these gopurams, I'm going off script, uh, are about 170 feet tall. So if you imagine that these with the bases there are leading to a tower 170 feet high, you only have to imagine just how monumental that base of the Gopuram would have been if it had been completed. So it's this early 17th century expansion uh, that served to re-emphasize this axial alignment of these buildings on Sundareshvara here. As you see, these careful alignment of the whole building on the center. And so, during Tirumala's reign, as I say, this period of expansion with this monumental hall and the foundations of a massive new gopuram served to re-emphasize the main east access to the Sundareshvara shrine and may have indeed have initiated the expansion of the whole complex by including the concentric street around the temple. If this had been completed, you have to imagine these gateways are in, or often in a wall. So this expansion, if it had included a wall that went around these streets, that sense in which the temple is expanding with ever larger layers out from the center. Now, many Tamil temples have been thoroughly renovated over the millennium or more of temple construction in this region. Temples are still being built to this day, so we have a long history of construction, renovation, uh, and change in these buildings. In the very earliest periods, uh, early brick structures were knocked down and replaced with a nice stone one. Later on, stone buildings were replaced with a new stone building. And so these stone structures have been regularly transformed into newer ones over the millennium-long history of these cities. And so the rebuilding of the city's many temples in the later 16th century was but one element in a wider remaking of Madurai as an imperial and sacred center under, Tiramala, under Nayaka rule, of which Tiramala is perhaps the most famous. And it's this historical context within which the Philadelphia Temple Hall was originally built, of this reconstruction of this temple city, this sacred and imperial political center. Other temples in the city were also built or transformed in the Nayaka period, including the major Vaishnava, uh, sorry, I've missed these slides, of the Pudu Mandapa, this monumental columned hall, and distinctive for the image of the patron and his predecessors that lined the aisle before a throne platform uh, where the goddess of the temple is brought during festival occasions. Other temples in the, cities, in the city were also uh, transformed or constructed anew in this period, including this major Vaishnava temple dedicated to Vishnu in his form as Kudo Araga, southwest of the center. Entering this temple today, one might anticipate finding an old structure dating to the 8th or 9th centuries, uh, the period of the Sri Vaishnava poet saints and the early Pandian rulers. But the Gopuram that you see here and on the, uh, the Gopuram on the far side and the main shrine you see it, there's someone walking around it to give you a sense of the monumental scale of this temple. This monumental three-storied Vimana, this uh, tower over the shrine, are all clearly of a later period. 
And so even if there had been a temple on the site for six or 700 years before, what you see there today is confirmed by inscriptions of the 1540s and 50s that confirm that actually this is a reconstruction of a much earlier temple. And indeed, this temple is a magnificent example with its rich ornament and high relief of a Nyaka period temple. Two other nearby temples, one dedicated to Shiva and one to Krishna, also date to this period, though both have been transformed through later renovations. And this is the main Meenakshi Sundareshvara temple here at the heart of the city, and we're down in this southwest corner of the city with the major Vaishnava temple of the city, the Kura Alaga temple, and a Shiva temple just here, and the Madana Gopala Swami temple, a temple dedicated to Krishna, seen here. And it's this corner of town where the Philadelphia Mandapa came from. And it's this corner, and indeed this building, this temple hall, which is called a Mandapam, uh, as part of the Tamil temple tradition that I now want to turn to. Now, sacred architecture establishes the conditions for religious ritual by framing topography, shaping space, and so, in a sense, architecture and ritual are mutually reinforcing. If one changes, you can see changes in the other. And what you see in South India over the course of the, the long uh, Tamil temple tradition is the importance of processional ritual, the movement of gods and goddesses that move around the temple in procession. And processional ritual is an important element that may help to explain the expansion and the elaboration of Tamil temple cities with their numerous large concentric walled enclosures, their many shrines, the long corridors, and indeed water-filled tanks. There's a very deep-rooted tradition of moving deities on procession in and around Tamil temples that may be traced to the seventh or eighth centuries. But it was in the 10th to 13th centuries that more substantive evidence from both literature and inscriptions indicate that processions have become an important feature of both religious and indeed royal ritual. Up until the 12th century in the Tamil country, the procession of mobile metal images of deities may not have resulted in architecturally defined festival space, or temporary wooden structures may have been used that have left no archeological trace. What we do have from the sense of this processional ritual is of course those bronze images that you can see in the gallery over the road that were made to be carried around. From the 12th century, however, in South India, the number, the scale, and the elaboration of buildings specifically designed for use during periodic rituals in Tamil temples developed. And this especially includes the construction of detached uh, columned halls or mandapas for the temporary display of deities. And this is suggestive, the gr growing volume of these buildings is suggestive of the growing importance of festivals. These columned halls, these columned mandapas, may be attached to the front of a series of closed columned halls that lead directly to a temple's main shrine on a long axis of access leading into the temple or they may be detached and freestanding at some distance from the other structures. These columned halls can vary enormously in scale from the ubiquitous small four-column pavilions, such as this one, to the monumental great columned halls, such as the thousand-columned mandapa at the Nataraja temple at Chidambaram that you see there. Several of these monumental thousand-columned halls were built uh, in some temples, there are two from the 13th century at Chidambaram, as you see here, and Shurangam. And in the late 16th century, one of these monumental halls was built at Madurai. I say a thousand column, it's sort of near enough a thousand. Sometimes if you go and count, it's actually sort of 982. But a thousand is a neater number. And so sometimes in festivals, they'll get another 18 palm trees to make it a thousand to sort of tidy it up a bit. But they are, they're monumental halls, and for much of the year, they may stay largely empty, or people go there to, to sleep, or just to eat their lunch, or for other activities that I'll come back to. 
But their primary purpose is, in a sense, this monumental scale, these temple halls, is for periodic festivals. This one at Shurangam, uh, the largest temple in South India, still a very active, busy temple to this day, uh, are built for the celebration of a range of different festivals across the year. And so often temples, instead of having one columned hall for festivals to take place in, over the course of time, bigger temples may have multiple columned halls for different festivals. And so a different building will be created for a different moment. These columned halls, when you go inside them, they're not always particularly impressive from the outside with just rows of columns and a flat roof. When you go inside, they may initially, such as the ones we've seen already, appear to be corridors just sort of leading you into the temple and to an encounter with the deity in his or her shrine at the far end. But I think perhaps a better analogy in going into one of these uh, columned halls is that they're galleries. They're spaces to move through, but they're also spaces for display. And in this case, the display is to, for a deity to hold court inside. And so this is the center of this columned hall leading along this corridor to a platform at the end where during a festival, the deity will be placed and receive people coming inside. And even when the interior has rows and rows of massed columns, particularly in one of these very large thousand columned halls, there's always a wider, higher central aisle guiding you through the center of the building. Towards, perhaps leading towards a shrine at the rear or more often a low platform where a deity will be placed temporarily. And so in, in an archaeology of performance in such structures, considering the mutual visibility and interaction between an imminent deity and the varying scale and social inclusiveness of the devotional audience is an important factor. But the emphasis on sight, this engagement with the deity, who sees and is seen by the deity, so critical to Hindu ritual, we also need to join that with uh, thinking about the broader sensorium in understanding festival mandapas. We perhaps also need to think about the acoustics of these flat roof buildings used for the oral collective recitation and instruction. We perhaps have to think about the music performances that may take place in them. Or think about the role of dances by professional women before the deity. We might also want to sort of think about what's the impact of smoke from the lamps and torches on inhibiting visibility within city spaces. Or think about what it must be like with the fragrance of flowers and incense billowing through these spaces. I think another aspect of thinking about these buildings is to look at them both from the perspective of devotees going into the building but also to turn that site around and try to imagine what these buildings look like from the god seated on the platform looking out at their audience. And it's worth then going to these temples today, particularly at festival times, to, to think about how these buildings are used today and to consider these two perspectives. And so if we go to an example of a temple, the Krishna temple, a place called Sriliputur, southwest of Madurai, and a temple built in the 1570s. This is the view from within one of these columned halls, as if you're the god sitting on a platform, on a raised platform, as I am, looking out at my devotional audience along this, along this line of columns in this open space in front. This is the view looking out, and you see the, these columned halls, as you see here in Hill of Philadelphia, lined with these figures sort of stepping out from the columns that line this aisle. But then at festival time, we turn this view around to see that same space from the other side, looking in with that crowd of people all clustered in this space, lit up at night with lights, leading towards that platform at the end where the priests are surrounding the god and the goddess placed on that central platform where they receive devotees in this hall of audience at festival time. 
Now, as these above examples have illustrated, the central processional aisle of these column mandapas is not only distinguished by its height and width, they get much wider and higher to make a, a grander processional space to move through. But they're also often characterized, particularly from the later 16th and into the 17th centuries, by the presence of these very large, elaborate sculpted columns. And in the 16th, 17th centuries, these columns are often animated by large figures up to two meters high that are attached to the monolithic columns. And these are one of the most remarkable artistic developments of the 16th and 17th centuries, this development of, of huge, great columns. Now, the roots of these composite columns, or piers, as they're sometimes called, with a large figure of a mythical animal, as seen here, these mythical animals that step forward from the column with images, columns with images of these mythical animals or deities, or even images of, of donor figures, perhaps portraits, may be traced to the 12th and 13th centuries in the Tamil region. The origins of this type of column are from the south, but then this Tamil temple tradition moves north to the capital of the Vijayanagara Empire in the 15th and early 16th centuries. And at the capital city, there are further developments of this architectural tradition that is then sent back south again. And it's full flowering as an artistic genre here and in Philadelphia takes place in the late 16th and through to the 18th century, particularly in the very far south of the Tamil region. And it's this sculptural tradition, this architectural sculptural tradition within temples, within these temple halls, that the material we have here in Philadelphia is part of. Now, in thinking about this type of sculpture, this type of architectural sculpture, there are different ways in which we might want to approach it, different ideas that we may want to think about this kind of material. We may want to look at the subjects of individual columns. You know, who is this deity? Who is this mythical animal? Who is this other figure? Once we start identifying one from another, we may then want to start connecting them together and think, are any of these columns related to each other? Are there any of these figures should be placed opposite each other or alongside each other? Can we start sort of thinking about, you know, is there a program, a way in which we could explain the distribution of images in one of these buildings? We may want to think about how these columns may relate to other aspects of the design of the building. Are there things around the roof or the entrance that may explain why this image is here and not there? And then we're starting to think about the experience of moving into, through, around one of these buildings, to think about how the design relates to the way in which it's used and seen by different communities. We may want to think about, well, what goes on in one of these buildings? How does that relate to the way in which the buildings design? We might also want to look at some of these sculptures, these bits of architectural column, the, these columns in, in the Philadelphia Gallery, and think about their materiality, the processes of sculptural production, to think about, well, what kind of stone is it? How do you actually make one of these? And it's with this kind of perspective on thinking about the nature of the stonework that I must emphasize that these columns are all monoliths. So when you see one of these columns, even when I say there's a figure attached, that figure isn't sort of carved separately and then sort of stuck on later. These are all one columns, one, one bit of stone carved out. I'm going to wander away from the microphone just for a moment to emphasize that. But this is a single piece. Any sculptors out there? No one working very hard material? Yes. If you're sculpting in granite, you know, you're, it's very hard material. You might be sort of smashing it rather than, you know, uh, nicely scooping out bits of a much softer limestone or sandstone. So I think when we're looking at this material and you say, wait a minute, this is granite, it's very hard. And then you look at this material again and you think, the amazing polish they get on the bodies of figures, the very fine detail of ornament, the way there's an enormous degree of undercutting that they've incised through it. 
Sometimes those figures of deities, an image of the, the South Indian goddess of love, Rati, who's got a little hole in her nose so that you can place a nose ring. And that they carve that hole so you can just put it. And occasionally people were there with a matchstick to just show you that there's a little hole through it. It's, it's just looking at this material, you may not like it aesthetically or you may not know who the deities are, who the subjects are, but just from appreciating it in terms of its materiality, the extraordinary virtuosity of sculpting these extraordinary three-dimensional volumes in very hard material, giving the detail, the polish, the undercutting, uh, is worth our admiration. Some principles or observations of the sculptural tradition as a whole. First of all, when looking at the subjects, broadly speaking, we can group some of the subjects. Are, are the deities depicted Shiva? Is it Shiva or his various forms or uh, friends or relations? Or are they related to Vishnu? Are they Vaishnava? And one of the things you find is that in a Shiva temple, in a temple dedicated to Shiva, you may find a mixture of Shiva and Vaishnava subjects and the vice versa. So there aren't exclusively all images of Shiva in a Shiva temple. There may be a mixture. Another aspect that I've already sort of alluded to is the fact that often column subjects uh, are often arranged in pairs. There are two figures who come together and they may face each other across an aisle or they may be placed alongside each other. But there are relationships between figures inside. Another aspect and this is a cautionary note to myself as much as anything. There isn't routinely a clear program that we can understand in these buildings. Sometimes there isn't a clear connection between to explain why did they choose that image rather than that image. Is there some relationship between the choice of deities depicted and the, the history of the temple, the reasons why God came to manifest him or herself in this particular place? So I... You know, as an art historian, I'm looking for sort of explanation and logic, and there isn't always a clear pattern. But it's not, but it isn't worth trying. So, in terms of the range of subjects depicted in the figural composite columns of Nayaka period, Tamil Nadu, the range of subjects depicted is very broad. The most common uh, figural column you find are these mythical lion-like yalis that you see here, these uh, liars, sort of combination between a lion and an elephant, uh, which is a mythical animal that you see. And some of the earliest of this type of column uh, dates to the 13th century in the Tamil region. And again, they, the tradition goes off to Vijayanagara, where you find examples of these Yali columns, and then it comes back south again. Related to these Yali columns, are these extraordinary composite columns with a cavalryman on a rearing horse, this mounted horseman. You often see rows of mounted cavalry rearing over the top of smaller soldiers underneath. These are often considered characteristic of the Vijayanagar period, although in fact they're rare at the capital itself, and they're much more common in, a re in the region further south between now what's southern Andhra Pradesh and the central Tamil region at the River Kaveri. They only occasionally appear in the very far south of the Tamil region. Their meaning and purpose is unclear, but they may potentially be related to the prevalence and importance of horses in the armies of the 16th century. An intriguing additional meaning, which I can't entirely explain as yet, may be sought by noting the retention of this imagery of a mounted warrior rearing over several foot soldiers in the painted terracotta village shrines dedicated to the Tamil folk deity Ayana, made in the past century. Now, there's a very wide variety of deities appearing in the column sculptures of Nayaka period Tamil Nadu, including deities known across India, both those well-known in Tamil Nadu before the 16th century and those rarely seen in sculptures before. There are also images of local Tamil deities and a variety of figures from folk literature. The range of images you see reflects both continuity with past practice and also the cultural changes associated with this period in the 16th and 17th. 
And these cultural changes include the migration of new social groups into Tamil Nadu from further north and the development of new literary genres such as the Stala Purana, the site myth, the site history, the myths that explain the reason why a temple is located where it is and why the god came to be there. In northern Tamil Nadu, such columns are largely of yalis and horsemen. In southern Tamil Nadu, there are far more examples of figural composite columns at numerous sites, and there's a much greater range of types. And I'd now like to introduce some key examples to illustrate these wider patterns. Now, Vishnu is most commonly depicted in one of his avatars, his descents. And at the base of some wooded hills, just a short distance north of Madurai, lies this Vaishnava temple at a place called Araka Koil. As part of the 16th and 17th century expansion of this 11th century temple foundation, a large rectangular flat-roofed columned hall was built in stone outside the dark interior of the temple. It's carefully aligned along an east-west axis between the temple's two pyramidal gateways or gopurams and the main shrine with its golden tower. Though rather unassuming from outside, the hall's interior is far more impressive, with large sculptures of deities, each up to two meters high, that seem to sort of burst forth from the columns in the, in the center of this wide, high-roofed aisle. These dynamic, sinuous, and three-dimensional figures are one of the distinctive features of the Nayaka period. And these huge architectural sculptures are of interest not only for the range of sculptures depicted, but also for their sculptural virtuosity that is displayed in working the very hard South Indian granite. In this hall at Alagokoil, Vishnu sits on the shoulder of his, of his winged Mount Garuda. Krishna plays his flute to enchant the cowgirls of Gokul. And Vishnu's man lion avatar, Narasimha, both seizes the demon Hiranyakashipu, and in another column alongside, places him along over, across his thighs and tears his entrails out. And it's these kind of pairing of sculptures with two moments in the myth placed alongside each other that is a feature of these monumental columns. Pairs of reluctance, as I say, is a common practice and go into another temple, the Nambiraya temple, uh, for some of you especially, at Tirukurungadi in South India, you see the two moments of seizing the Hiranyakashipu and then ripping his entrails out rather unkindly alongside. There's a similar variety of Shaiva subject matter in figural composite columns of the Nayaka period, though again, certain deities appear more often. Uh, one of the commonest is Nataraja with Kali in the dance contest with Shiva as the dancing lord defeats the goddess Kali. Figural composite columns of the multi-armed Nataraja dancing in a ring of fire and in his form as Uddhava Tandava, his left leg high above his head, defeating Kali in the dance contest at Chidambaram are some of the most striking examples of this sculpture. And this is both for their scale and also indeed the complexity of sculpting the many arms and attributes fanning out from these figures. Uh, a nice old hero bicycle just there at the bottom to give you a sense of the, the monumental scale of this sculpture. Shiva appears in many other forms as uh, Bhikshatana, as Gajasamhara defeating the elephant demon. There he is stretching the skin of the flayed elephant around him in this photograph from the 1860s. Shiva appears at the Pudumandapa in Madurai, seated with his consort, uh, Parvati or Uma, uh, resting on Mount Kailash, the mountain at the center of the universe on which he inhabits, with the ten-headed demon Ravana, the anti-hero, or hero if you're a Tamil, of the, the Ramayana, uh, just trying to disturb them, these northerners coming south. Stick to the script, yes. So, a wide variety of Shaiva deities. Now, while many of these monumental sculptures with, may be identified with reference to widely known Puranic myths and iconographies and traced to contemporary Argamas, there are other images that, that appear in this type of sculpture in the 16th and 17th century which are not so easily identified. 
One such sculpture is the sculpture of a woman cradling a baby in her right hand and holding a woven basket in her left, standing almost as if poised to dance, her long hair gathered in a bun to one side and wearing heavy jewelry and a long pleated skirt. This is the standard iconography for the sculpted images of the female Kurati, often identified as lower caste itinerant fortune tellers, which appear in Nayaka period architectural sculpture. Such images may appear with her male counterpart who tiptoes forwards holding a staff in one hand and in the other a small pouch which contain the aphrodisiacs and medicinal herbs that he sells or perhaps a sling for catching birds. And these are figures from a very productive genre of Tamil literature from the later 17th through to the early 19th century, originally performed often, though not exclusively, in a temple context at festivals, there was roles around two love affairs, with the Kuravanji, or Kurati, a woman from the Kurava caste, providing the link. The main protagonists fear in temple sculptures from the 1560s, over a century prior to the prominence of this genre in written literature. And there's a sense in which the appearance of these sculptures suggests a connection with the migration of new social groups through southern India in the period under discussion, and indeed the increasing representative representation of previously marginal groups in the public sphere of the temple. The Kurati that we saw previously and these ones are examples of large architectural sculptures, often up to two meters high from this period, from the late 16th through to the 18th centuries, that depict figures that are not from a familiar canon of Vaishnava and Shaiva deities that appear in temple sculpture prior to this date, or indeed in most later temple sculpture from the later 19th century on, when there's a, de a degree of sort of religious orthodoxy seems to oust such uh, sort of folk figures. And so, from an art historical perspective, I would identify the Nayaka period as important for the appearance in sculpture, especially in the very far south of, in, of the Tamil region, of figures from various forms of regional literature to a good degree unknown before or after. And these include uh, figures from the pan Indian Mahabharata, Arjuna and Karna, who do appear together, but sometimes there are uh, figures from the Tamil version of the Mahabharata, or figures illustrating specifically Tamil events in uh, the, the Mahabharata, such as this image of Rama's brother uh, Lakshmana, who uh, in the Mahabharata uh, kills Ravana, or mutilates, sorry, mutilates um, Ravana's sister Shupanaka, but rather than just cutting off her nose and ears, as is familiar elsewhere, also severs her breasts, as seen in this sculpture. And I'll leave it there, I'm hanging on that point. Uh, other figures who also appear, which is uh, particularly significant for the way in which we think about the temple hall here, uh, there are also uh, figures which include a fight between Bhima, the, the figure from the Mahabharata who holds the club, and a lion-legged figure called Purushamurga. Both, both of these figures are with clubs. And you often see these figures either on the same column here, or sometimes in adjacent columns or facing each other. Um, and here is an example of Purusha Murga here in the gallery, and there is the two figures wrapping around the column, waving their clubs at Nongunari. There are also figures from site-specific myths, and these are particularly illustrated in Madurai, where the myths explaining why Shiva comes to the city, why he comes there, takes the name Sundareshvara, why does he marry the local goddess Meenakshi, and all his heroic exploits, killing the elephant demon who comes to the city uh, and whose remains lie on the outside. And these mythic events explaining the presence of the deities and the site appear in the sculpture at this period, as seen here. Some other figures defy easy identification, of which these images seen here are some of the most common, these uh, extraordinary large figures of a heroic warrior figure, sometimes identified by locals as Virabhadra, a fierce form of Shiva, although the, the, these doesn't quite fit with the iconography you see here. But it's a figure who's 
ubiquitous in the stone and indeed wooden sculpture of the temples of this far south, which can't always be easily explained. Now, the city visited by Adeline Pepper Gibson in 1912, and I am trying to conclude, on an extended tour following her marriage the previous year, had been transformed over the past century. In 1801, Madurai came within the expanding political orbit of the British East India Company. In the 1840s, the British initiated a campaign of urban regeneration, during which the fortification walls of the old city were pulled down and the surrounding moats filled in. In the late 19th century, the population expanded to reach over 100,000 by the early 1900s, compared with only about 50,000 in 1870. Uh, to give you a sense of context, in 2019, the population was about one and a half million. Increasing numbers of tourists and indeed pilgrims visited the city, helped by the expanding railway network that connected Madurai with other major cities in South India. Postcards and guidebooks of the period draw attention to the magnificent temples of Madurai with their soaring pyramidal gopurams and extraordinary sculpture lining the corridors. But the richly active temples of Madurai were not static moments frozen at the moment of their first construction. Many temples have been renovated in Madurai in recent decades during a period of Tamil cultural renaissance, religious reform, and pious temple construction by new elites under British colonial rule. In Madurai's Kuda Araga, uh, or Vishnu temple we saw previously, southwest of the village temple, the goddess shrine adjacent to the main god's shrine was pulled down in 1907 and was replaced with a nice new one by 1923. The nearby Madana Gopala or Krishna temple was in a poor state of repair and old temple columns lay abandoned in its courtyard. And so it was this city at a moment of change that Adeline Gibson arrived in in 1912. And it was perhaps the long-standing Western fascination with the, West, uh, with the virtuosity of South Indian sculpture that made it explain Mrs. Gibson's extraordinary decision to purchase stone columns over Easter weekend in April 1912 that seemingly lay abandoned. But furthermore, she came from a distinguished wealthy Philadelphia family who were established patrons of the arts, and so perhaps collecting was already on her mind. So in conclusion, What's the place of this building and its sculpture within the reception, collection, and evaluation of Indian art in the West? For the many European countries with long-established trading connections with South India, not only Britain, but also France, the Netherlands, and Denmark, examples of South Indian art had entered museum and private collections from the late 17th century. This included sculpture in stone or bronze, such as the bronzes on the far side, collected in Trankabar, a Danish colony, in uh, South India, and they're amongst the very earliest South Indian bronze images that entered a European collection. And these uh, things collected by uh, residents in South India, foreign residents in South India, included sculpture, paintings of deities, or indeed paintings of religious practices and other religious paraphernalia, such as you see here. But the years around 1910-12, when Mrs. Gibson set off on her travels from Philadelphia, marked a change in the perception of Indian sculpture and painting in the West, as they came to be more highly regarded, not only as demonstrating examples of craft skill or illustrative of religious practices, but as fine art in their own right. In the States, as in Europe, this resulted in museums and collectors starting to acquire further examples of the finest sculptures and paintings from India from the 1920s and on. And so the donation of this temple hall to the Philadelphia Museum of Art in 1919, in a sense, arrived at just the right time, contributing to the foundations of one of the foremost collections of South Asian art in the United States, which it remains to this day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. We have some time now. Um, if any questions or thoughts have occurred to you, um, and I think there's a mic on that side of the room. If you'll just wait a moment, I would be interested. If you just wait a moment, 
I was interested in uh, more the programmatic details of each column. In a temple, would uh, a donor say, I want this on this column? Because there'll have to be some regulatory behavior as to what you could put inside in terms of the various deities. So were there donors who paid money for a column? Was there an architect and somebody who would draw out things? Or do we have examples of drawings to show the whole temple and what would be on each column? How many workers would work on each column over a period of time? That whole kind of concept. You're asking all the kind of questions students should be asking and that we as scholars, we've been trying to answer these kind of questions of how can we understand the construction of this, the relationship between artist and patron. A brief answer and a bit of an adequate one is, by and large, we don't know, usually. Um, we just don't have the evidence there often to understand always who built this, why. Um, you know, it's our job as scholars coming later on to take an interest and then to try and seek explanations. In terms of the planning of temples, uh, on the whole, temples weren't planned by getting a piece of paper or palm leaf and saying, this is what we want. Can I have one like this with this there? There are uh, ways in which uh, Stapatis, the, the, the architect craftsman of these temples, learn how to design things. There are... Uh, there are texts which describe an ideal layout for temples. But there's an ideal and there's a practice. And when it comes to the practice, often it's these columned halls further away from the ritual center of the temple that actually we know least about. And this, in a sense, is why these, are, these columned halls further away from the ritual, most sacred heart of the temple, where we see a much wider diversity of characters. When it comes to, I'll try and answer a range of the good questions there. Uh, when it comes to, to patronage of these buildings, occasionally we have the name of a patron so we know that you know, a particular king or merchant or other lord may have been the patron of a building. But often temples were built not by under the direction of one person, but actually as, as community collaborative endeavors. And we know this from other examples from, from these ones. So in terms of this particular hall and in Madurai, we have a variety of evidence that certainly there was sometimes elite patronage, but sometimes also there are examples where a range of people were involved in their construction. I hope that goes partial way to answering some of that. But they, they, you know, they're good questions that for my colleagues in the audience know it's the kind of things we really want to know is you know who built this and why and when and and why is it like this and not like that and we just wish that there was a contemporary evidence that would just neatly explain it so uh, if i may i was born in madurai oh, great yes <laughs> uh, i'm just a visitor yeah. <laughs> a passionate it, it, one the even though I didn't live there uh, long enough, it always fascinated me to see those thousand pillar hall mm. and the gopurams, you know, the mm. uh, gateways to the temple. Mm. Um, during your research, and uh, how would you describe the influence of uh, Pandyas in the architecture of the temples versus, for example, if I have to choose the Pallavas in Mahabalipuram, you know, they don't have this enormous uh, gopurams with their temples. Different aspects of that. First of all, I'm a confirmed southerner. So um, anything in Pandya to me is always going to be, you know, distance from Madurai is, is my lodestone. So um, the Pallavas are northerners as far as I'm concerned. So, <laughs> you know, not as good as Pandyas. That's my bias because I spent more time in the very far south. Um, you mentioned the, one of the problems with the study of Pandya art and architecture is that there isn't much to see. There is some, but there isn't as much. So the Pallavas of northern Tamil Nadu, famous for their temples at Kanchipuram and indeed at Mamalapuram by the sea, Mahabalipuram or Mamalapuram uh, by the seaside just south of Chennai. They're very well known and they've been very well known in the West 
uh, and, and around India through their study and interpretation, the drawings, the photographs made from, not photographs, but drawings made from the 1780s on. The Pandyas have always, it, to some sense, have been lesser known. One of the problems is that many temples, such as the many temples in Madurai, as I say, have been rebuilt, have been renovated, because they're active, living, religious sites. And what happens is that often, during some enthusiastic renovation, there's a nice new temple, not the preservation of a, an old one. So when it comes to evaluating the evidence of Pandya art, many Pandya monuments are not there anymore. The temple you see today may have been originally a Pandya temple from the 7th, 8th, 9th century, but the material fabric you see there today is much lower. And that makes an evaluation of Pallava versus Pandya harder, simply for the survival of evidence. When it comes to the Gopuram that you mentioned, that there are Gopurams in the Pallava realm, actually the Pallavas were ruling in, in northern Tamil Nadu in a period where the Gopura was still an, an earlier idea in terms of architectural history. And it's only really the, the full flowering of these monumental uh, pyramidal gateways actually takes place after the Pallava dynasty has largely faded away. So again, it's a matter of chronology and academic nitpicking, I think, to, to make that a comparison. But which do I like? Pandyas every time. This is fantastic, thank you. Uh, my question is going back to the floor plan of the Madurai Minakshi temple. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that Madurai uh, Minakshi was the local goddess, but mm -hmm. in the if you look at the size of uh, the two temples, the red dot and the blue dot, there was is 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 that some, is there something to do with the male versus female, like who who is more important in the history or like the floor plan for the blue dot, I feel is bigger than Minakshi's temple, or mm -hmm. is it just wasn't that much? I mean, the temple is often known, as many of you may know, it's sometimes just a shorthand, it's the Minakshi temple, because the goddess is more important. She was there first, Shiva came later. And, you know, Minakshi is, is ritually preeminent often in festivals, and yet, this is where what goes on may suggest one thing in terms of the relationship between god and goddess, but the architecture is suggesting something different. So I put this, and I can't remember why, why I chose blue and red. There's no specific meaning to the, the blue and red. Um, why I, I put that there was to emphasize the fact that despite the fact that we may call it the Meenakshi Temple and the goddess is terribly important, architecturally, everything aligns with Sundareshvara at the middle. And he's sort of, sort of got a bit more space. And he, the, go, the gateways align with him. And all through the festival rituals that take place today in Madurai, there's an ongoing tension between the relationship between these two. You know, is Meenakshi more important, or is she only important through her marriage? And the, f the ritual life of the festivals played out in these architectural spaces is about that negotiation. And this is where ritual life and architecture work together to explore and explain those kind of divine relationships between the god and the goddess. Sometimes these, if a slight tangent from that, but you know, sometimes in the Tamil region, there's the tradition that, you know, do you have a Madurai marriage or a Chidambaram marriage? And it's about if, you know, is, is the goddess more important in your marriage or, or the god, depending on temples? And the spatial layout of Chidambaram, where God is at the center, and the goddess has been cast out to the northern zone of, of the city because she'd lost the dance contest. She decided she wasn't going to pick up an earring with her toe and lift it back into her ear. Well, that's probably not a good thing to do, so she lost the dance contest, and her shrines in the north. So it's the way in which ritual myth plays out in architectural design that you see here too. Uh, wasn't Manakshi there first? I mean, wasn't she enthroned yeah. first? Yeah, she was. So that kind of had to add him on to her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Meenakshi was a Pandya goddess, uh, and she was born 
to uh, the king and queen of, of Madurai, and you know they desperately wanted a child, and were then moderately disappointed to get a daughter. I'm outraged at this. Um, not only were they, uh, they a daughter was born to them, but a daughter with three breasts. But they were reassured by the fact that they were told that don't worry, it's okay. When she grows up. She'll become a great Chakravartin. She'll become a, a conqueror of the eight directions of space. She'll go and conquer the land and be a good upholder of the Pandya dynastic imperial tradition. So indeed, Minakshi becomes Tathataka. Actually, she takes on Minakshi later, uh, the name later. Uh, she conquers the east, the south, and all the directions of space until she gets to the far north of India and to the northeast where the prophecy was that when she met her future husband, her third breast would disappear. And she arrives in North India, she meets Ishana, form of Shiva, her third breast disappears. And she said, I'll marry you, but only if you come home with me. And so Shiva comes south, back to her town, rather than she going to his birthplace. So that's the Tamil tradition, and so that's Yes, it's Shiva, and he has a big temple here, but it's the relationship between the two that is the defining feature that explains the city. But ultimately, yes, it's her city. Are there any other questions? Uh, the way a person becomes a sculptor uh, is the sculptural tradition uh, for those who actually make it anything mm. at all like it is in the West where there might be there's an apprenticeship program are any of the people recognized uh, particularly recognized as very famous sculptors or particularly virtuosic um, and you know like uh, perhaps there are families wherein the, this is a tradition that carries on for across generations mm. or anything like that. Mm. I mean, who makes, uh, actually who makes, makes this it? stuff? Who actually <laughs> makes it? Yeah, I mean, this is something, you know, this is part of the problems with studying the Indian artistic tradition more broadly, that we don't, we often may know who, who put up the money to pay for something, but we don't always know who actually made it. And when we do have the names of, of sculptors, or I'll leave painters out here, excuse me to the painting people here, but I'll just stick with sculptors. Um, you know, we may have the name of somebody, but we don't necessarily know very much about them. So we're left with a name, but nothing much more. Now, broadly speaking, the artistic tradition doesn't celebrate the work of individuals. There isn't a celebration of innovation that is, you know, the, the romantic artistic tradition of the West that celebrates the signature architecture and individuals doing their own thing. So to answer it in terms of the Tamil sculptural and architectural tradition, we don't really know the names of, of artists and sculptors. One of the earliest names of, of sculpt, among the earliest names I found is comparatively recently is, is people building temples from about 1900 and 1910, where at last I have a name. And one of the sculptors who was working with uh, a French scholar in 1910, uh, just near Pondicherry in Tamil Nadu, um, I was interested in the fact that this work by a French scholar mentioned the name of the architect that he'd been working with. And so I was talking about this with a Tamil Stapati, a craftsman, recently, and he said, oh yeah, that's my grandfather. So in answer to your question, yes, it's family lineages. And so the craftsman architects today are often from family lineages, and actually we don't know enough about those lineages and how far they go back. But in terms of sculpting and, archi and architecture, it tends to be male lineages that has passed down father to son through multiple generations. It, be it becomes a specialized activity. And it's really only from the 20th century that we have the names of artists. In terms of learning technique, it tends to be you learn on site in a workshop. Uh, it's only from the 1950s when a government school of architecture and sculpture was set up at Mahabalipuram that they started running diploma courses in temple architecture and sculpture. And now you can get a degree in temple architecture. And those temple architects then set up practices in Chennai and Bangalore and work on commissions in, well, rural Philadelphia perhaps, where the South 
Indian community perhaps say we want a nice temple, we want it to be an authentic temple. And so these Thapatis are recruited from South India to come and build temples abroad. So it's a workshop, lineal male succession with memorization of practices through repetition of proportion and uh, alignment is, is how the sculptor tradition works. Uh, sculptors tend not to be from the higher castes and neither do they come from those outside uh, the, the caste system. You know, caste is, is however it's understood, is, has sometimes been much more fluid than people recognise. But there's also a moment where uh, caste status in the colonial period was much contested. And in the 1880s and 90s and 1900s, perhaps in relation to the fact that many temples were being built at that time at a period of cultural reform and the Tamil Renaissance of literature and the arts, uh, many stapathies, many of these traditional craftsmen were claiming higher status. And so they were making claims to say, no, we're Brahmins. Uh, many other Brahmins would say, no, you're not. But it's this, they tend to be from the, the many non-Brahmin classes in, in the Tamil region. Uh, of which there is a wide, wide range. So. We have time for one more question. And I'm happy to hang around if you want. <laughs> or we could go to the gallery to look at the hall. I would love to do that. But uh, I, I'm going to ask one question, yeah. um, which is, uh, so I love the way their presentation came all the way around, uh, looking at the expansion of the temple complex and ending with the removal of, of, of pieces of temples. Which, uh, and it, it got me thinking, uh, I know what happens to these pieces in places like rural North India. I don't know what happens to them in urban South India. So I w I'm wondering if you'd be willing to speculate what might have happened to these pillars, uh, to this hall had it remained in Madurai? Would it have been reused or incorporated into a new building? Would it have been discarded on the street? Do, do you have some sense for uh, sort of the, the dynamics of reuse in urban Tamil? Madurai? It's a good question. Um, as I say, at the time, this, let's go back to it, that uh, without getting into precisely where the temple might have come from, but you know, all three of these temples were significantly renovated in, in the period between about 1890 and, and 1920. Um, my speculation on what happens to all the material is by and large it's not reused. So the stonework from old temples is discarded. Um, and we can thank Adeline Gibson for saving this material which might otherwise have disappeared. There was a, a new temple is built, the old columns are discarded and there's something new. An exception to that is the sculpture, which makes it a very interesting exception that uh, many uh, South Indian temples, if I go back to, let's see if I can illustrate one with, I probably won't have one to illustrate it, but you know, when you go to one of the, yes, this will do. Um, if you see one of these stone buildings, you've got the sculptured figures of which still saw by them, or as they are known as those doors. And as the Tamil temple tradition developed, there are these distinct niches on the side of the temple. And they tend to sort of window into the god who would emerge out. Now, this stone sculpture is precisely the sort of sculpture that you can then take out and sell to the international art market should it feel 
I think that there may have been an example of where there's an old sculpture, but in, in a new temple element like you were just describing. Uh, Sorry. That's all right. Just call out when you'd like to look at it. These are all single pieces. Nothing's been added. Uh, yeah, that one. Okay. So it looks like it may be an old sculpture, but a newer, uh, newer temple. But it, it's partly, um, it's partly not very good repair. So. <laughs> um, uh, these are, I mean, that's why I have to say, besides, actually what I should do. No. Um, uh, these temples, of many of them are still in use. And actually, one of the reasons why I first got interested in these buildings is precisely because they're not archaeological sites. They're not nice static monuments with a little fence around it and now with a nice lawn and flowers that you pay your ticket to visit as a visitor to one of these archaeological sites. They're active living temples. It means they're still used. They're painted. They're oiled. People tie things around it. They make offerings, you know, in there. They're buildings of use. And so, as an art historian looking at these, you have to negotiate the fact that they're still in use. And that includes repairs made with more or less money and skill to, to old material. Some of these, when I was last there uh, a couple of years ago at this temple, I'd always thought, oh, this is a fine example of 16th, 17th century. And with your eagle eyes looking at the picture, you go, yeah, that's not that old. And you see that someone's made a rather crude repair with a bit of cement and wire, because sometimes the fingers get broken. So, but in terms of are these new, no, it's still the old stone work, but it's been painted, it's been whitewashed and oiled. So, the bl if it appears black, it's often because uh, oil has been rubbed over the surface. If you want to get a nice shiny polish on this stone, uh, it's, it's not just the nature of the stone, it's actually what you do to it. So you need iron abrasives and then oil, and then you get another bit of stone, as you probably know, and you just have to be patient to get the really high polish that can be achieved on this granite sculpture. But then that also means that sometimes these, these sculptures are then oiled to enhance the shine. And when you go into one of these temples, particularly if you go in and there's a power cut, say, and they've just lit a temple with just little oil lamps, and you go into the dark temple and the oil lamps are just casting a flickering light on the shiny oiled surface of these sculptures stepping out of the darkness, it's quite impressive. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. Um, thank you all for being here. And thank you. Thank you for your questions.